If you've been on the internet for the last few years, you have seen these black and white pop therapy phrases kind of take over, depending on what side of the internet you're on. And while they have value, I also believe that they are rotting people's brains a little, which is why I want to talk about it in this podcast episode. We are talking phrases like, I am not responsible for anyone else's feelings. All feelings are valid. If someone doesn't communicate an issue with me, that's on them. It's their problem. You were allowed to change your mind. Before I dive into the juicy stuff, welcome to Grow With Intention, the podcast for people who want to create a life that feels good. And before I really get into the episode, I have a necessary little bit of nuance to add. I absolutely used to parrot these phrases and I wouldn't judge anyone who did parrot these phrases because they make a lot of sense in certain contexts with certain nuance. But without the right context, without the right nuance, I think that they can also wreak havoc and I have seen them wreak havoc in the world. This is something I've actually talked about a lot with a few friends, so I just have so many thoughts and feelings to share. And let's get into it with the very first phrase that has been all over the internet for the last few years, which is, I am not responsible for anyone else's feelings. This phrase is so easy to weaponize, which is one of the biggest problems that I have with it. It's a lot like saying, I am not responsible for other people's safety if you're on the road. As a driver, you're not responsible for other people's safety on the road. You're responsible for driving safely. If you do something dumb, thoughtless, totally unintentional that happens to hurt other people, it's still possible to take some responsibility. Now, in some contexts, obviously this phrase is really, really helpful. Like this is a phrase I used to say all the time. For example, if you are having a hard conversation with a friend who is consistently 30 minutes late and you're trying to tell them like, hey, you need to stop being 30 minutes late all the time. You might say to yourself, you know, I'm not responsible for other people's feelings to amp yourself up to have that conversation. If you are dealing with like a really moody coworker or even a really moody like partner or roommate that cannot regulate their own emotions and you feel this urge inside of you to like fix their lives and regulate their emotions for them, saying to yourself, I'm not responsible for other people's emotions is obviously very helpful. One of the biggest points of confusion for this phrase is that other people having feelings in response to your behavior is not them asking you to be responsible for their feelings. It is completely up to you whether you want to care about someone's feelings or whether you want to dismiss someone's feelings for a good reason. If I were to add some nuance to this phrase to make it a generally more helpful phrase, which like obviously these phrases will never catch on because they're not black and white and the internet loves a little black and white, I would say I can be empathetic and kind when I confront people or reject people, but their feelings might still be hurt. And I can't control that. Or I don't need to emotionally regulate other people. That's their responsibility. As with all of these phrases, there is nuance that I am not able to cover. If you think of some nuance, chuck it in the comments. Phrase number two that you would have seen all over the internet, depending on what side of the internet you are on, is all feelings are valid. All feelings are messengers. So valid actually means having sound basis in logic and fact. And if you've ever had feelings, any feelings, any big feelings, you know that most feelings are not always 100% based in fact. Some feelings are totally based in delusion and assumption, and they aren't 100% worth listening to. I don't hate this phrase, all feelings are valid, but sometimes I do think that it's used to validate feelings that aren't based in fact and tell people that they are right, when in fact it would be worth questioning their assumptions. And the same thing goes with all feelings are messengers. I understand how this is supposed to be helpful, but for people who have lots of big emotions that change pretty quickly, thinking of all feelings as messengers and like real big things that you have to deal with can be deeply unhelpful. There are lots of feelings in my mind that I think you should be able to ignore. And I know a lot of people on the internet in the feeling space might crucify me for that. But for example, occasionally I PMS and I have all these bad thoughts in my head and I wallow in them. And then after the fact, I'm like, oh, damn, I was just PMSing. Like, no need to think any more deeply on those thoughts and feelings. And I don't just get those thoughts and feelings when I'm PMSing. Like, sometimes I just get them randomly during the month. And they truly don't mean anything. And if I were to assume that they actually meant something and were meaningful and carried messages would cause me more harm than good. Instead, the best thing I can do for myself in those moments is don't pay too much attention to my feelings. Just let them exist. Don't think about them and move on. That's a lesson that I wish I had learned earlier in life. And I do think that the black and white, all feelings are valid, all feelings are messengers, ideas on the internet caused me to have less emotional regulation versus more. The next phrase, and I have so much to say about this. If someone else has a problem with you, it is their responsibility to communicate that to you. 
that is on them. This actually isn't a take that I totally disagree with, obviously. But if after something has happened, then you can sense that something's off, or maybe someone's blown up at you about something that happened a long time ago, and you are shouting from the rooftops, it's not my responsibility to assume how other people feel. It's their responsibility to communicate that with me. You should also be able to, with deep confidence, say, I am a safe person for conflict. It would be super safe for a friend, family member, partner to bring conflict to me, whether they were frustrated with me or sad because of a behavior that I had done. If you have a habit of having conflict with people and moving straight to lying, blaming, shit talking about that person, being super defensive, being dismissive of other people's feelings, don't be shocked when other people don't come to you with their issues. And I can say this as someone who wasn't a super safe space for conflict in the past. I definitely don't lie, blame, or I'm not a super defensive person, but I can be and have had a history of being dismissive, 100%. I've worked really hard to try to not be that person and I'm still working on it. I feel like I've made a lot of progress. I want to put that out there because I don't want to be a hypocrite. I just see this take so often on the internet. People will repost it and it's like a little bit passive aggressive. And I get it because it's something that I have said before because it can make you feel better in the moment if you think someone has a problem with you to be like, well, it's their responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not that I disagree, but if you are really clinging on to that phrase, but you aren't also doing the work to make yourself a safe space for conflict, it makes sense if people do not confront you. Being a safe space for conflict doesn't mean that if someone comes to you and goes, you did this, this, and this, you go, I agree, I'm the worst. But it does mean that if someone comes to you with conflict, you practice empathy and you try to understand. That's the first thing you do. You try to understand where they're coming from. Being a safe space for conflict is also being someone who understands that conflict is a normal part of relationships and that conflict can actually make your relationships healthier. The best way that I have seen someone advertise that they are a safe space for conflict is by talking about the other conflicts that they've had with friends in their life. So I've seen people do this poorly. I've seen people do this well. I've done this poorly, actually. For example, my sister, she's had some conflicts in her life and she's gotten much better at handling conflicts, I would say. And when she talks about conflicts, she will say things like, I understand where they're coming from. I probably could have done this different etc, etc. She is not shit talking the people that she has had conflict with. She's talking about the conflict in a really empathetic manner. I've also seen people have conflict with others. And in that conflict, they have lied to the other person. They've shit talked about that person to like everyone in their life. For me, I've talked about conflict before. And I've said things like, they're just making a big deal of nothing which to a part of me may feel true, but it doesn't demonstrate that I'm a healthy space for conflict. Someone could very easily hear that and go, oh damn, like, well, I don't want to bring out anything up with Michelle because she's going to think that I'm making a big deal of nothing. If you're listening to this and you're like, oh my God, I'm not a safe space for conflict. That's something that you can definitely work on. This is not a call out. This is a call in. You don't owe anyone an explanation is true. Technically, you don't owe anyone an explanation, but Maybe you used to hang out with your bestie for the rest of you every single week, but all of a sudden you're like, oh damn, that's actually too excessive for me. I'm doing too much. I'm going to dial it back to once a month. And so you dial it back to once a month, but you don't offer any explanation. For sure, you don't owe anyone an explanation in that scenario, but you are going to cause confusion and hurt if you're not explaining yourself in some circumstances. You don't owe anyone an explanation works really well in situations where you're communicating with someone that you don't trust, that hasn't earned your trust, or you're communicating with someone that you know will try to argue with your explanations and has no ability to respect other people's boundaries. If you are dealing with someone close that you love and you are delivering bad news to them or you're you know, pulling out of something or you're telling them that they can't do something or you're unhappy with them and you don't offer them an explanation, it's going to cause confusion and hurt. And this is a piece of advice that is just so common, especially for people pleasing pages on Instagram. If I were to replace this phrase with something more nuanced that would never take off, I would say sometimes providing an explanation is the kindest and most thoughtful approach and it can benefit you as well as the other person. Or another way you might phrase it would be if you don't know someone well or you don't trust them, you don't owe them an explanation. The next phrase that I see a lot is you're allowed to change your mind. And if we're going to extend that, you're allowed to not respond to texts. You're allowed to cancel plans. Technically, you are allowed to do anything. And I agree with all of the above. But if you change your mind, for example, 
this is not a thing that happened to me. It sounds like I'm pulling from a real life experience, but I'm not. If you are, you know, someone's maid of honor and you pull out two days before the wedding and you're repeating to yourself, you were allowed to change your mind. Technically that is true, but there will be consequences. I think I understand where these phrases are coming from and these ideas are coming from. It's okay to do all of the above. You are allowed to change your mind. You're allowed to not respond to your text. You're allowed to cancel plans. But also it's okay for other people to have reactions to you doing that if you cause them some kind of disappointment. If you committed to something, you've gone, oh my God, I'll absolutely be there for you. And then two days before the event, you're like, sorry, can't go. And you're saying to yourself, you know, I'm allowed to change my mind. I don't know that that is doing you a service or any of your loved ones a service. If you are on absolute struggle street and these phrases have really helped you, fair enough. Keep on using them. In some contexts, they make sense. From personal experience, I would say better phrases to cling to would be, I'm allowed to be thoughtful before committing to something. I would much rather someone simply not commit and say, nah, like, sorry, I can't help you out with that or I can't come to your thing or give me some time to think about it because I keep on overcommitting myself instead of cancelling on me last minute. This one probably frustrates me more because it's a bit of a pet peeve. I don't like being cancelled on last minute. Not when it's like multiple times in a row. I can handle, you know, once, maybe twice, but when it gets beyond that, I struggle with empathizing. I also think that how much these can apply can also depend on the safety of your relationships. Like there are some friendships in my life where if they didn't respond to my text, I'd be like, whatever. I'd probably call them out. I'd be like, bitch, you're not responding to any of my texts. What is happening? And if they canceled on plans, I'd probably do much the same. But there are also some relationships where if someone did any of these behaviors, I'd be like, okay, they're trying to like ditch me because we don't have that safe of a relationship for them to be doing those behaviors. So once again, it can be context dependent. I would love to hear your thoughts and feelings on this topic because I don't know if anyone else has had this topic top of mind or if it's really just been like me and a few people I know. But for me and a few people I know, it has been such a topic of conversation. So I would absolutely love to hear your thoughts and feelings. Let's wrap this podcast up with my recs of the week. At the end of all my podcast episodes, I like to give at least two recommendations for you to dive deeper into the topic at hand. So the first recommendation that I would have if you enjoy this podcast episode and you've had some of these thoughts would be Sirut Shala's Instagram. She has a very tough love approach to therapy and self-growth. Some of her posts I don't fully agree with, but I still like seeing her takes on things and certainly they've made me think and self-reflect a lot more than a lot of other Instagram therapy type accounts do. So I'll have that linked in the show notes. The other rec of the week is called Leadership and Self-Deception, and it's by the Arvinger Institute. This is a really random book recommendation. You may be thinking as you hear this, because it's actually a business book. But I talked about this, my people pleaser episode. I feel like empathy is the thing that is missing from a lot of these takes and a lot of the insta therapy accounts on the internet so much of the advice out there applies to people who are dealing with like narcissistic people people who are dealing with takers with generally not great people and that makes sense like it makes sense to apply a lot of this advice to difficult people who just take 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 and don't seem to have the capacity for empathy or kindness but a lot of this advice in my opinion it shouldn't be applied to people that we love and care for And that's where instead it would be more helpful to try to understand people, to empathize. Yes, empathize with yourself, but also just deeply empathize with other people and try to understand where people are coming from instead of pulling out these hot take pop therapy phrases that kind of tap into your ego. That's how I feel. I'm saying this as someone who used to say these phrases, like I used to parrot these phrases and I don't think that they helped me and I don't think that they helped my relationships. Instead, it's been a lot more helpful to tap into a more nuanced perspective, drop the black and white thinking, up the empathy. And this book, Leadership and Self-Deception, even though it's a corporate book, it can totally 100% apply to all of your interpersonal relationships. And I recommend you give it a read. Welcome to Mini Moves, the next segment of the podcast where I share two mini tiny action steps that you can take literally today to put what I've shared into place. Today's episode, I only have one mini move for you, and that is to think critically when you see these really decisive, absolute black and white takes that apply to the relationships in your life. 
I have taken a while to get to the point where I hear a hot black and white take and I don't immediately go and start questioning myself and being like, damn, are they right? And I think it's a really important skill to be able to develop, particularly in the world of TikTok, where everyone's out here with these really high intensity, absolute takes. So the next time that you see a hot take, black and white, your mini move is to sit back and reflect and be like, okay, do I believe this to be true? How would I feel if someone applied this idea to me? Are there any circumstances where this doesn't make sense? I think if there was a lot more of that on the internet, it would just be a much better place. You can even do that with the stuff in this podcast episode. I won't mind. I appreciate you so much and I'll see you in the next step.